Hey everybody, Pete A. Turner, executive producer and host of your Break It Down show. Hopefully you all are digging the new Trubify intros that we're doing. For sure, if you're a musician or a comedian or someone who does lives a lot, you're going to want to talk to me about Trubify. Make sure you do that. I definitely work with these guys. I support them because what they do works and it's getting better every day. So Trubify, check it out. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. All right, enough about that plug and stuff. Let's talk about our guest today. You're going to love this. You know that thing called the onion? Maybe you've seen Babylon B headlines. They kind of do the same kind of thing. Satirical news, right? Well, the guy that started the onion is his name Scott Dickers. By the way, hat tip to Brett for hooking us up. Scott is a brilliant comedian. He has these three different books on how to write funny. You definitely should check those out. Look in the show notes, Amazon, click on that link. That will help support us uh, and also support Scott. This guy's hilarious. Look, The Onion and how they write their satirical headlines and how they just step over the line of reality and absurdity and really poke fun at us, the system, politics, whatever it's going to be. You know, we love stuff like that. We we get into a long, rangy conversation. You know how I do it. And it, we talk from, like from Irma Bombeck all the way over to Donald Trump. And we cover everything in between. And and here's what you're going to find out. And this is not anybody familiar with the show. It's not going to surprise you. Scott and I don't agree on a lot of things. It's fine. We can have a conversation that's smart, that is um, collaborative. And we can talk. But the thing is, is more often than not, we're agreeing on things. Could things be better? Yes. Are things as bad as everybody wants them to be? Well, probably not. And so we look at all these different elements and aspects. And you just hear Scott being real, being true. And... I'm going to tell you, you're going to like the guy. You're just going to like him. You may not agree politically, but that doesn't matter. And maybe you do agree politically. He's a big Bernie supporter, just so you know, going in. I think you're going to love who he is, how he approaches life, and how he sees it. And and when you look, you're like, yeah, I, I can understand why you feel this way, why you would like these things to be better. So I think you guys will enjoy this show. I know I did. I just edited it. And I thought, man, this is a quality show. I'm really proud of it. We didn't get... We didn't avoid politics, but we did it in a way that allows us all to, you know, just reasonable and rational. And I think that we've all got time for that, especially in this time when everybody's trying to not be reasonable and rational. All right, enough about that stuff. Listen, one of the best ways you can support the show is, of course, going to Amazon. If you're going to join Audible, which I definitely recommend you do, let me know. I'll send you a link. I'll put it in the show notes, whatever you guys need. If you go to Amazon, you're going to buy something. By all means, let me know. I will send you our show link and that will help us out. It's just a little bit of something, but you know, it's something. Also, I'm going to do another round of shirts. Uh, my old shirts are all wearing out, so it's time for me to get some new ones. You'll see that soon. And the other thing is, is uh, we're getting ready to close out. I think there's like 100 tickets left for the Save the Brave rifle. It's a $5,000 retail price rifle. You can win it in the raffle and allow us to raise some money for Save the Brave. You know how we love that. Ride for the Brave happened back in July, and we're just now finishing up the, the raising fund, fundraising <laughs> for the rifle uh, made by the folks over at Blackstone Arms in Dallas, Texas. All right. One more thing to say to you. You know what I'm going to say now? Here comes Scott Dickers. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proops. This is Jordan Harbin. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morales. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hey, this is Scott Dickers, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. Oh, man. This is great, man. I... First off, I like to say this, but it's important that, that folks who've done something incredible hear it more often because you just don't get to hear it enough from all of us out here in humanity. Thank you. Thank you for oh, what you've done for the last thank you for, 30 years. You know. <laughs> thank you for saying that, Pete. It's very nice of you. It's So for those that you don't know, and I guess it's possible that they don't, uh, you founded The Onion and have written satirical commentary-based just entertainment for for years you've written movies you've written books you've directed movies just all, all kinds of things you're very i guess i guess a modern form of mark twain you know i guess would be fair to say that's very uh very high praise indeed i uh yeah i i've always been obsessed with doing comedy and i'm always doing some kind of comedy or other and worked with a lot of incredible people over the years done a lot of various things with different people done a couple of things on my own and yeah i i look back and i marvel myself at <laughs> all, uh, 
how did I do all that stuff? But, yeah. Yeah. So, and there's a lot of information that you've covered with about the basics. So I'm going to do bet my best to not cover any of that stuff because there's just so oh, many great that. podcasts with you out there. By the way, your podcast is awesome as well. I, I really enjoy it. Oh, thank that. you. Thank you. Um, did people like Irma Bombeck inspire you when you, cause like we're basically the same age, a couple years difference. That's it. But Probably, did people yeah. like her inspire your comedy or how did you get this voice, this satirical voice? <clears throat> Irma Bombeck absolutely inspired me. My mother used to love her and read from her, um, but she didn't inspire me in exactly the way that you would think. So I think of her writing as in the conversational style. I, I break down in my book, How to Write Funny, I break down the spectrum of humor writing mm. and conversational is kind of in the middle. It's not satirical. It's not even formulaic. And it's, it's not like uh, kid stuff, which is the, the least sophisticated category. It's in the middle. Mm -hmm. And Dave Barry is another person who uses that style. And I was never a big fan of it. And I, even as a young kid, I, I knew that it wasn't very sophisticated. It was very on the nose, which is something that, you know, professional comedy writers and script writers always try to avoid. You always want to create some sort of facade for the audience because it's a lot more fun. And so... What inspires me typically is work that that I think I could do better. Like it's work, and I'm not saying Irma Bombeck is bad. I'm just saying it never really made me laugh, like gut laugh. Mm -hmm. I appreciated it, but I could see how much better writing could be. Same with like Mad Magazine, National Lampoon. And I was too young for the, the Lampoon's golden age. So I saw it when it was on the wane. <laughs> and... I see that and I'm like, well, I could do, I could do something like that. Like, I, I, I feel like I'm capable of that. When I see work that's just astoundingly good, that kind of like depresses me. And it's like, uh, why bother? Like <laughs> that person's already out there doing amazing work. I could never touch that. Spy Magazine made me think that. When The Onion first started, they were amazing. And they, they came about a little, a few years before The Onion. And they were the big national humor publication when The Onion was starting out. And every month we'd get the new spy and, and just, you know, our hearts would sink because we knew that The Onion was never going to be as good as spy. So those sort of things kind of stopped me dead in my tracks. But bad comedy, that lights a fire under me. Yeah, that's a, that's a funny way to approach it. Yeah, no, no, it's just the way I am. I don't know why. It's weird. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, too, is, is uh, movies like Raising Arizona had to have hit you in a way that made sense to you. Because a lot of people, back when the Coen brothers were just starting out, they were as young as The Onion were, was, um, you know, you didn't quite get them because they are a little quirky. They are a little satirical. And, and yeah. I, I know that they had to have had some kind of touch on what you created. Absolutely. That movie had a big impact on me. It came out the year I graduated from high school and they grew up in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, where my dad lived. And I spent a lot of time there as a youngster. I never met them. They're a few years older than I am, but I loved that movie. It was so unique and so fresh and so different. Like that was a th thing about it. Like, yeah. you know, the, for me, the, the, one essential ingredient in all comedy is surprise. And so when you're doing something that's a cliche or you're doing something that's in the same format as something we've seen before, you're gonna have to work really hard to make it funny. But when you're doing something completely out of the box, when you're breaking the mold, like it was a throwback to like the Preston Sturges movies, you know, of the forties. Uh, it was something that, it was like a reinvention of that for the, for the modern age. And it was so, uh, energetic and crazy. John Goodman is amazing. William Forsyth is just, oh my God, he's like, I've loved that actor ever since that movie. And obviously Nicolas Cage. And um, uh, why am I spacing on her name? You can uh, do it. Who, you can who do played it. Ed, who played Ed. She was in Broadcast News. She yes. was in The Incredibles. Keep I'm totally going. spacing. You know who I'm talking about. I can't do it either. I you mean, can't do it either. Uh, Area, uh, Area Man's Tongue. Yeah. Uh, no, name of 
man, um, I can't do it. I was hoping that by you going through the name, list, name was... of that actress on the tip of area man's tongue. Well, I um, will, uh, I will find the name while we're sitting here talking. Yeah, just, just go- <laughs> Google it so we don't go crazy. That is contagious when you can't think of a name. Totally pull her name up normally, and you're right. She normally, played, it's right there. You know, <laughs> it's yeah. So funny. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is, is how does your Midwestern sensibility, and along the, with the Cohen brothers, and I, I'm assuming that Irma Bombeck probably had some kind of Midwestern roots too, just because she guessing. seems that way. But does totally. that is that or is that something that I'm putting on you? That's not fair. No, I think when I compare myself to a lot of the humor writers or comedy people who come out of the coasts, a lot of them have really different upbringings. They're, they're moneyed. They're kind of provincial. I didn't have any of that. Like, Mm. you know, my grandma lived in a trailer park and we had, we were on food stamps and I had to work summer jobs to help out. So that puts you in a position of wanting to tear down established authority. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes you a better satirist in general, because tearing down establishment, authority, things about society that are kind of entrenched and accepted as the norm, you, you just, you grow up having resentment against that and it festers really deep. So that's going to come out. And and Brett Allen, by the way, hat tip to Brett Allen for hooking us up. It's it's a, oh, yeah. it's a great lift. He uh, he did it. Holly Hunter was the name. Holly Hunter. Yeah. <laughs> and this will not surprise you. Irma Bombeck was raised in Dayton, Ohio. I mean, it's it's right on the money. Uh, that. No, that doesn't sur- uh, surprise me at all. Yeah, yeah. When when you look at how things are today, and satirical, it's a satirical goldmine because. Whether or not you like President Trump, one, he definitely has a humorous bent to him, but he does stuff that just feeds comedy, whether you hate him or love him. And then the left, as they counter him, are equally ridiculous. And you need a lot of ridiculousness to be able to really, you know, hit home runs, I think, in the satirical field. Do you, are you able to not write something every day about what's in the news and the headlines or, or are you just over it after all these years? No, I, I want to do it more. So I'm one of those people who like people come to me all the time and say, how can you do satire now? Everything's so absurd. I'm one of those people who has always seen plenty of absurdity in this world. There's stupidity everywhere because people are generally pretty stupid. So you're going to see stupidity on the right. You're going to see it on the left. You're going to see it among uh, rich people and poor people, black people and white people. So I don't work at The Onion anymore and I don't write satire every day. I do have a humor website called blafo.com where I put stuff and other people write stuff that I would have put in The Onion had I still worked there and I just didn't have a place for it. So I was like, all right, I'm making this and putting it up. But lately, I've had so many thoughts about what's going on that they couldn't be contained simply in headlines and fake news articles. So. I started crafting a novel and it really just kind of bubbled up like a spring and I pumped it out in about 24 days and I just finished it yesterday. So that's kind of where my comedy energy has gone in recent weeks. What has happened recently that just makes you smack yourself in the head? I mean, there's so many crazy, ridiculous things like, for example, When there's literally a story that says mail-in ballots create a problem because we, you know, we have all these things. And then the left says, you know, it doesn't handle that. And then the right, God bless the right. Uh, that, you know what? I'm going to stop. Right <laughs> no, I'll, I'll answer you. So yeah. uh, it's essentially the theme of my book. And that is my, my book is kind of a love letter to mankind's greatest achievement. Uh, which I believe is science. And it's an admonishment of mankind's greatest weakness, which I believe is religion. And they are in contrast. And the theme of the book is being able to tell the difference between fantasy and reality. Science tells us what's real. And fantasy is fun, 
but we shouldn't believe it. And there are people in this world now, and this is the thing that drives me crazy is to answer your question, who reject doctors, they reject science, and they won't wear a mask. And so they show up at a big rally and they get sick and they die. And they believe lies. They have no criteria by which to judge what is true. And that's unbelievable to me. Absolutely unbelievable. And But we're, we're raised with that because we're raised with religion, which teaches you to believe things that aren't true, to believe fairy tales and fantasies. And it's harmed us so much throughout history. And I think we would have been fine without it. But we can't help it because we're human. We have an innate need for religion. It's the only way that we can explain uh, the, the world around us. I read this amazing book a while back called Religion Explained by Pascal Boyer that just totally blew my mind. Uh, and I, I walk around with a lot of his ideas in my head all the time, like hyperactive agent detection, which is just a beautiful theory of evolutionary psychology. But those sorts of things get me thinking. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm one of those annoying um, sort of holier than thou people who just goes around every day thinking people are stupid. But I feel like I'm also really good at seeing my own stupidity and the stupidity in humanity in general. So I can write about that in a way that doesn't um, uh, put me on a pedestal and make me feel like I'm better than anyone else. You know? Yeah, that's a great, a great thing. And I want to come back to that. But first, I, I want to ask about so we've had a lot of scientists come on. Let me back up even further and say this. I was ruminating on this today as I was getting ready to talk to you and trying to think of some of the satirical ideas because you and I have a, a, I'm not putting myself on your level in terms of success and everything, but I like to take phrases and turn them like you, you, the way you describe satire, how it, you know, like it, it impacts the uh, the comfortable and makes comfortable the impacted or whatever. But um, Yeah, right, right. You know, in terms of facts, right? Here's here, here's a fact and there's just no way out of this box. Science says that tomato is a fruit. Policy or politics says, because the Supreme Court has found on this, that it's a vegetable. And, and these things can't be, <laughs> can't exist in the same factual world. And yet, well, to be, to, we be uh, to be more precise about it, I believe um, the Reagan administration declared ketchup a vegetable. No, it was earlier than that. There was a Supreme Court was decision. It? Yeah, and it was based <laughs> okay. upon imports, you know, and how All they right. dealt with it. Yeah. And so well, to me, of, that's, yeah. yeah, to me, that's just a matter of semantics. Um, I don't care what they call a fruit and what they call a vegetable. All I know is tomatoes are delicious. Yes, they are delicious. <laughs> but, but it is like, a, it does reveal like how politics can like warp reality and, and make us do things that don't make sense. And also, it, it well, gives, language can warp it as well. Well, that's true semantics. Too. Yeah, absolutely. We also have this perception that there are single solutions to extremely complex problems. Like for the most part in the U.S. and in many nations around the world, the, the big problems are solved for the most part. You know, it, but the harder problems that are multivariate and, and challenging, they don't respond as well to I know how to fix this. If you're, you know, if you're so talented, let's get it done. So it, it, there's a and this happens to all of them, but that sense of. I know what to do. And that's why we hire them. They say they know what they're going to do. And we believe them. But they lose something along the way because all these other things get saddled to the legislative ideas. And, and so we get these preposterous outcomes where we had to make a deal and this thing slides in. Compromises. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah. that water everything down to nothing. Yeah. 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 Um, are comedians are comedians good politicians if we gave them a chance? Or would, would you all be terrible at this? Yeah, what, there was a comedian who ran for mayor somewhere recently, and I can't remember. Uh, I don't think it was in America. I think it was somewhere else. Maybe somebody knows that and can um, send that in. But I believe they are because especially comedians who do satire, because satirists care, like they care about making the world a better place. Okay. Most politicians obviously want it for the power, so they're in it for the totally wrong reason. They get there and they just become totally corrupted by the money. And the last thing they would do is something to help the people. Like, are you aware of that Princeton University study they did recently where they compared um, public opinion polls about what people want mm, no. versus, <laughs> versus what Congress fights for and achieves in terms of law? It turns out, so shockingly, that Congress is totally 
at the service of rich corporations and they'll do whatever they want. The, the rich corporations get 100% of what they want. The people get average 50-50 chance of getting what they want. In the last 50 or 60 years, the line has gone like this. Yeah, they're just bought and paid for, uh, yeah. our politicians. So yeah, I feel like a comedian can kind of see through that. Like I love the political work John Stewart is doing right now, fighting for the 9-11 uh, Victims Fund. I mean, the, um, the emergency workers and the movie he just made about money and politics, I thought was great. And I love some of the things that John Oliver is doing, where he's calling his audience to action mm-hmm. about really, you know, obvious things that people just aren't informed. Because right. the media is is just laughably out of touch with anything that's really important. <laughs> they are not in the informing business. I no, often... they're in the entertainment. They're in the infotainment. Yes. Yes. How do you, I'd get rid of info. They're just in the entertainment business. Uh, and they're also foot servants of our corporate masters because that's where they get their advertising. They can't piss them off. So, you know, all these news anchors are millionaires. Like You don't see anybody on major network or cable news who isn't a millionaire, all the pundits, all the hosts. So they're not going to be on there talking about what's good for regular people. They're going to be talking about what's good for them and what's good for their corporate masters. Because as soon as they say something against the corporate masters, they're gone. It happens all the time. Yeah. (laughs) And again, everyone, everyone does it. The, uh, yeah. As someone who's got a degree in mass comm and whatever the hell that means, when I watch like a White House press briefing, it doesn't matter who's sitting in the office as president. I'm embarrassed by how bad they are at asking questions. It's always these entertainment yeah. focused questions looking to right. like, like, look, drudge up the drama. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like, I'm yeah, a spot. Totally. I know all about asking questions. And when you ask a closed question, you're seeking to control the conversation. That's not sure. your job as a journalist. It's just not. Yeah. <sighs> I'm going to calm down for a second. Get all. <laughs> Um, Okay, so you've written your book. I want to hear more about that because that's new. Yeah, so I just finished this book. I sent it out to my team of beta readers, and I'm going to be getting notes back tomorrow, going to make some final uh, tweaks to it and send it off to my agent. It's called The Joke at the End of the World, and it's about a 12-year-old boy from the 1950s who ends up experiencing the apocalypse in the year 2020. It's like I said, it's a satirical uh, Vonnegut esque journey with a lot of twists and turns Mm -hmm. um, that, like I said, it was the only way I I could think of to encapsulate all the things that I've been thinking about with all the craziness going on, going around, Um, you know, the state of politics, the state of media, um, climate change. Oh yeah. Coronavirus. Yes. Uh, all, all the stuff, you know, wrapped up into one. We're, we've been living in the apocalypse for the past 30 years and our leaders have known it and they don't do anything about it. Um, the book doesn't really touch on that, but it touches on the absurdity of us being in that position right now. Yeah. Yes, it does. <laughs> the absurdity is, is going on right now. The, uh, you remember when we cared about immigration? And when we cared about the climate, even, I mean, just even any of these things, it's just, I don't know that we ever cared. Well, I think back in the seventies, caring about the environment was a bipartisan issue. Yeah. And after Reagan, that was kind of the turning point. The right decided, oh, we don't care about the environment. We care more about business and they should be able to dump any chemical they want. Yes. And now Democrats have moved there too. So now they believe that corporations should dump any kind of chemical they want. And there's this fringe element on the far left, AOC, Bernie, et cetera, who are like, um, we, we should not be dumping chemicals in the environment. And everybody's laughing at them like they're crazy. That's where we're at. Yeah. That's where we're at. <laughs> and That's if right. we had just listened to uh, Jimmy Carter, <laughs> uh, we wouldn't be in this situation at all. We it's would have funny. moved away from fossil fuels and we would have been do- using renewable energy and we would have had a lot more time. It's funny that uh, Jimmy Carter has improved as a president, you know, in the, since the, the 40 plus years since he's been president. Well, he was not a good president in terms of his leadership. You know, he was he was quite bumbling, but his heart was in the right place. No question. And he was smart. He was a nuclear yeah. scientist. You know? Has that been true of any president since then? 
Heart in the right place? No, absolutely not. Um, absolutely not. Everybody since then has been uh, a stooge for um, corporations, in my opinion. I'm getting really radical here. That's all right. Yeah, be- I don't mind. That's, I'm a radical. I've always been a radical. It's just it's that my opinions have gotten more radical as the world has, the pendulum of the world has drifted in this other direction. In the, in the in the 70s I was a normal person <laughs> yeah I mean look we all get more cynical as we get older yeah do, you, do does cynicism impact your your view of the world in a way that isn't useful to your art no cynicism is totally useful to my art it's not very helpful in my personal life so I try to keep a cap on it yeah yeah because I want to be ha- you know I want to be happy and I want to have a good life and so if I go around thinking everybody's awful and the world is awful and we're doomed then that's no fun I'm always struck by how often people, and I mean, people as like as society, how often we forget things. Like uh, I'm sure you recall this when we first or last rebranded Aunt Jemima to be less offensive. She's and, been slowly evolving over the yeah. decade, and so is Mr. Peanut. I mean, like brands always evolve and everything. But sure, you know, the Coca Cola could... logo has gone through the same <laughs> very <laughs> slow evolution. Yeah. But we Campbell seem to forget stoop. that. It, you know, yeah, we... well, humans aren't built to. Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. Yeah, well, humans aren't built to think of things long term. They're not built to think of long distances, long spans of time. Mm-hmm. We're, we're built to react to emergencies. Yeah. And that's, satis- that's very satisfying to deal with an emergency. And so a slow issue like climate change is something that, you know, the whole world is literally in denial of that right now. We're in the first stage of grief. So by the time we reach the fifth stage, acceptance can be way too late. Yeah. It also strikes me as funny as a guy that remembers things. I recall when George the Younger, President Obama, and Donald Trump have all said, I am the greatest president for the environment since Teddy Roosevelt. They always put Teddy <laughs> Roosevelt right. out there because right, they've right, done right. X more than anybody else has done, whether it's secure land or you know create legislation, whatever it is. They, they all yeah. say that. And yet, here we are, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um... I wish we had another Teddy Roosevelt. That would be amazing. Remember, isn't that funny to remember back when- Could we take it though? Could we take Teddy today? Yeah. Well, we need him. Okay. But isn't it funny to think that progressives in that day were Republicans? Yeah. 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 I yeah. love that. Yeah. How how the pendulum has swung. Yeah. 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 How about, have, he also was, you know, he busted up uh, corporations. The and, big trusts. Yeah. You know, yeah. And those yeah, are- Yeah. No, he was- um, uh, a radical leftist by anyone's measure today. Yeah, for sure. For sure. But exasperating to the establishment, you know, they, yeah. Uh, it was like the whole idea of the bully pulpit was to go out there and fight for people against the powerful. And that has fallen so far out of vogue. Um, (laughs) I love the quote. It's not a quote, exact quote, but I'll paraphrase the quote of that damned cowboy is the president of the United States. <laughs> like as soon as the kid <laughs> leaves that, like someone loses their mind. Love it. Yeah. Love it. One of the other things that's funny, if you have any kind of memory is that president Trump did in, not invent in lying by a president and also did not invent enriching yeah. oneself as the president. This is almost a universal value. Now he definitely takes it to a new level. Oh, sure. I'll give him that. Yeah. But the onion did a funny front page uh, recently that was, um, all presidents from Washington through Obama, this is when Obama was president, um, may have lied. And it was a picture of all the presidents in a box. Yeah, because I want to be, ha- you know, I want to be happy and I want to have a good life. And so if I go around thinking everybody's off. And I, I want to make sure I give a shout out, not to be competitive or anything, but the Babylon Bee writes just the, the best stuff. And like I- They're doing good work. Yeah, it's hard to do Christian comedy. It's hard to do right wing comedy, honestly, um, because of the whole thing you mentioned about confront. Uh, afflicting the afflicted and comfort and comforting the comfortable. Yeah. But they, they are doing top notch work. I, I hand it to them. They manage. I, I wouldn't want to compare like who does it, you know, better, I, I hand. you know, better, but they managed to get just half a step over to the absurd and away from reality. Yeah. And you, you and I both know, and both you're the onion and Babylon B 
are going to over the next five years have actual headlines that become reality. I mean, yeah, happens all the time. Yeah. Life is absolutely imitating fiction. It's just, yes, it is. It's ridiculous. That used to be my favorite thing when onion headlines would come true later. There's just nothing more satisfying because in comedy, you always operate under the assumption, under the truth, the fact that anything you create, anything you write or concoct in your head to be funny is never going to be as funny as real life because real life has the best humor. You just can't compete with it when real things happen. So when you write something and then it does happen in real life and it's funny, it's like that's the kind of the gold standard, you know, the holy grail of comedy writing. There's um, one of the things I like to try to do is get some of these, uh, I'll call them villains, um, you know, on the show so I can humanize them a little bit, mm. understand them. Uh, some some dramatic villains that we have in, in the zeitgeist are Nazis, uh, Hillary Clinton, like nothing in reality of what's thought about her is what she actually is. She's become this mega uber bad guys. Um, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> any of the... <laughs> Any of the prime senators, you know, whether it's Senate, Senate majority leaders or the minority, like all of those folks are are made into such. They're, it's the WWE with with the characterization of, you know, Harry Reid or Chuck Schumer or any of these guys, right? Like they're all just preposterous in how we see them. Yeah. Does that does that in any way benefit us or is that just, or is it good for the soul because we can look at him and, and make jokes, Mitch McConnell. I mean, how can you not look at that guy and think anything other than what a fucking asshole, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. Uh, he's so brazen about his, um, devotion to his donors. Like it's just brazen. And I, I mystifies me that people vote for that. <laughs> I just don't get it. But Hillary Clinton is no different. She's just a foot servant for the establishment. And, you know, I think way deep down in her black little heart, there's room for, you know, helping children, which she once did <laughs> as yeah. a young woman. Um, those those things are so long gone. And once people get to a certain level of power, I think uh, it's just hard for them to connect back. You know, so you see people like her, you know, Nancy Pelosi. What is Nancy Pelosi's net worth? It's like four hundred million dollars. Yeah, nothing. Nothing like that's That's just like how. How does a person like that even, and the fact that she calls herself the resistance and she does these play resistance things like ripping up Trump's speech, but meanwhile, her, her house like votes for everything Trump wants. Like, I don't understand it. It's the, the Democrats and the Republicans are the same and they're not on our side. <laughs> so and I think it's, I think it's fine that we make them out to be villains. Of course they're human beings. Yeah. But they're human beings who live in such a twisted context that a regular people like us could never hope to understand what that's like and how that warps your brain to have that much money and that much power. Like that's corrupting. There's no there's no two ways about it. We know that. Is there anybody you're confident in voting for for president, like any of the candidates at all? Yeah, I was a Bernie guy and I wanted Bernie to win. Um I don't think he fights hard enough and I don't think he's a good charismatic leader, but he, for me, he was right on every policy. He was, he was Teddy Roosevelt. He believed essentially in the same stuff yeah. and in Theodore Roosevelt, I'm sorry, in uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So those are two of our greatest presidents. We've totally forgotten why they were great and what they did. And the fringe minority that was against them at the time is now the majority. So, you know, the establishment beat Bernie for the second election in a row. It was sad to see. Yeah. So, yeah. And if AOC ever runs for president, I'm a thousand percent on board. I love her. Is is Bernie too old? Biden too, Trump too, but is he too old and too No, he rich? has his wits. He has his wits. Okay. He's, he's, he's the poorest member of Congress. He's like, he's about as rich as my dad. He has like a million dollars in retirement. Uh, he's a normal person. Okay. You know? Yeah. Um, AOC is a normal person. She was a bartender four years ago. Yeah. And I like that. I like yeah. that. That's what, that's what makes them sensible. You know, Trump has been eating with a gold spoon his entire life. Entire he he life, doesn't, yeah. Yeah. 
doesn't have any connection with regular people. And yet he takes on all of these orphan causes, you know, like closing the loop between federal and Native American jurisdictions to get all these kids that are getting scooped up. He's written a lot of reg- EOs for uh, veterans. Like He takes on these things. You're like, how, I can't reconcile like his passion for solving these little problems or whatever it is, if it's passion or whatever. But it's not pandering like if it's like helping human trafficking be reduced. You know, So how do we reconcile these things? Because we, we tend to take the scale with President Trump and just, bam, put it all inside a negative and there's no chance mm-hmm. for positive. But he does do yeah. things where you're like, I, I like to post them like... <clears throat> Here's a here's a win, and then no, we can't have a win. All the comments after that, but there are things. Yeah. How do we reconcile this? Well, I'm a, every, anytime he does something that I agree with, uh, I, and I think is good. Like I give him credit for that. Like great, okay, wonderful. He yeah. did the right thing. He usually does it for the wrong reasons, hey. but that's fine. Yeah. Let him. Do, I'll take the win. Um, but for me, it's a matter of just recognizing that every human being is a bungle of of contradictions. That's yeah. just who we are. That's what we are. So nobody's all good and all bad. You know, you can go out there and say, well, Martin Luther King was a great leader and he's awesome. And someone will say, yeah, but he uh, raped a bunch of women. Yeah. And then you can talk about Trump, you know, well, he's a horrible human being who just lies all the time. He's a rich asshole. And then somebody will say, yeah, but he did criminal justice reform or whatever. Right. So that's just, that's just how it is. Yeah. Um, Thomas Jefferson, you know, you go back, you name anybody. There's going to be good and bad. And now in the cancel culture, we're trying to completely flush people down the toilet for doing something bad. And I'm against that. I think, and if, you know, to each his own, if you sure. can't listen to a Bill Cosby record anymore, don't listen to a Bill Cosby record. That's fine. Yeah. But don't take him away from me because I grew up on his comedy. I love it. And I will acknowledge that he's a terrible human being who did unspeakable things and he should be prison in prison for that but i love his comedy and i love his albums and he's a master who deserves to be studied for that if you're going to cancel somebody you should be able to speak intelligently about the pluses and minuses you're right i mean i can do this with bill cosby for a while i mean look at yeah. the way he blazed trails and sure. established you know pathways clear pathways not only for for blacks to be in front of the camera but behind the camera absolutely you know normalized um life in the hood through fat albert and that kind of like he did all of these absolutely. things absolutely wonderful and yeah he he humanized um black people for a lot of white people who didn't know any black people right, right. um he did he did so much for uh civil rights and the black power movement in the seventies, he was at the cusp of that. There's no question about it. Yeah. And even like, uh, I mean, obviously the Cosby's was enormously important to huge, to the country, huge. But, yeah. But also the show after that, which I can't think of the name of it, you know, that had Bill nothing. Cosby, I think it was. No, no, no. I the one remember. with the college kids when they all go to Spelman. Or oh, uh, it was uh, a different world. On it. Yeah. A different world. Thank you. Yeah. And it truly was a different world. That is not, you know, like at the same time, you probably had the kids from Save the Bell going through college as well, you know, and, and or within a year or two of each other. And those right. are different worlds completely to, yeah. to see black kids living in a black, you know, college and doing all these things. I just, right. Pitch that, pitch that show, you know, <laughs> to the corporate execs. And only Bill Cosby could do that 30 years ago. You know? It's true. It's true. And another thing in Bill Cosby's defense, and of course we don't defend defend rape and drugging women, but he also took black entertainers and said, this is how you manage your money. And one of the greatest success stories is Ray Parker Jr. Cause he laid it out. He's like this much for investment, this much for taxes, this much for spending. I didn't know he did that. That's great. And he did that for all kinds of people like taught because again, they wouldn't know it necessarily coming from where they came. Yeah. From. They, they came from generational poverty, a lot of black people. So Chris Rock does a great routine on that where he talks about the difference between being rich and yes. being wealthy. That's yeah. a wonderful bit yeah. um, that a lot of black people who get new money, you know, uh, they, they blow it all on a boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We all, um, new you know, money across the board, the same thing. That. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anybody gets new money. They're going to be in trouble. Yeah. It's uh, um, if you cancel Bill Cosby, you, you don't see the value in that. And I, I definitely see the value in that. I, you know, of course you don't want to approve, you know, the exploitation of women in any way, but yeah, you can't just cancel that. And and when I go to DC and I, I sit at, or stand at the uh, Jefferson Memorial and I read his words and then you put slavery on the scale with it, it is a motherfucker to deal with, you know, mentally. Like you yeah. really have to. And, and then <clears throat> the thing I want to add to this and then I'll throw it over to you is 
how am I doing the same thing today? Like, where am I incongruent in my exactly, beliefs? exactly? Well, I'll give you one one area that I touch on in, in my novel mm. because I think we can look back on that day and say, how did those people? reconcile all their talk of freedom while they have slaves. And I think from all the writings, we know that Jefferson was tortured internally about that, but it was too radical in his day to come out and say that. So what today, today the equivalent is that we all still have slaves, yeah. but they're overseas and we don't see them. And we have a middleman who are all the corporations who employ them yeah. <laughs> and we enjoy the cell phone batteries that they make and so forth. And we're happy with that. We're okay with that. And yeah. I, I, I hope there's some future day when we look back and say, Oh my God, yeah. just the way we look back on slavery in the South in America and are horrified by how people could have lived with that because children are working till they drop in factories overseas for very little money. And uh, we're benefiting from that every day. Not to mention all of the uh, extraction of, of the minerals. Mining. And yeah. Doing all the mining. Absolutely. And I mean, I mean the garbage mining too, where they're burning rubber off of wire and, and extracting, you know, the chemicals. Yeah. And, you right. Know, we're not doing yeah, that. Poisoning here. people. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. No, no, but we'll happily go to some country where they don't regulate that. And, and nab that stuff. No problem. <laughs> well, I don't want to pay more than a thousand dollars for my iPhone now. Come on. Exactly. You don't want to pay what something's worth. Like <laughs> that's exactly, that's exactly what the Southern slaveholders argued. Yeah. They, they were like, well, we're making good money. Like you can't expect me to pay them a living wage. Like I wouldn't make any money. Yeah. Same exact argument. Wait, and, and, and but, but to us now we haven't learned a thing Yeah. because to us we'll say, well, well I'm not going to pay Fifty-six dollars for a gallon of gas—that's absurd, yeah. you know. Yeah. But what's what's the cost of that gallon of gas? Well, we're destroying the entire world. That's the cost, yeah. and it's worth a lot more than three fifty. And, and to be fair to the South, if you sent bales of cotton north that were three x the cost of the other guy's bale of cotton, or they tobacco, wouldn't have bought it. They wouldn't have bought yeah. it. And they would have said, "Find a way to drive the price down." Oh, okay, absolutely. So, so we, the guy, the guy with all the slaves, is gonna yeah. is gonna uh, succeed where, while everyone else fails. Yeah. So you know, that's uh, that's one of the problems of capitalism, no question about it. Given our current environment politically, could we even solve a problem? Could we pass an amendment and get it through? Are we just as guilty? <laughs> no, no, impossible. Yeah. Impossible. The, the An opinion like that would be absurdly radical yeah. at this point. And I would submit, too, that folks like Jefferson or Washington, they were willing to and recognize the evil of slavery and were prepared to release you know, the slaves upon their death. But I would imagine that it was politically too dangerous you know i mean the yeah, country's absolutely. just it was. starting you know it's like to make that radical step to say i'm freeing all of them yep it just it was it wasn't possible to do because they had to look after their own livelihood and and the nation may not have survived it you know I mean, we only barely got 13 together to to agree and that involves some real trickery you know it's true yeah it's absolutely true so yeah, we're in the same boat. Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Solving different problems, but still the same. <laughs> These are Grecian problems too, and Sumerian problems. Uh, Nothing has changed with that. Yeah, it's a human. They're human problems, and we have created so many of these problems by virtue of the fact that we evolved the way we did. Like we have certain failings that are inherent to us, yeah. and we're always going to have them. Like maybe under the right circumstances in 2 million years will evolve different uh -huh. <laughs> characteristics, mm -hmm. but I don't think we're going to be here that long. And in the meantime, happy to make fun of those foibles with my satire. Yes. Well, you get to play with the pendulum no matter where it is, you know, and yeah, you I don't totally know that do. it ever rests in the middle, but it definitely almost never. Yeah. Yeah. When I, when I think about, you know, like the, the political pendulum, whatever, the balance that we create, there's there's a problem with the, the basic nature of our country and is that we are as diverse as any, and we self-select our diversity. People come here from all over the place, which is wonderful, except for diversity and unity are basically antonyms. And so we look at places that are not diverse and they're able to move in one common direction because they have a lot more unity 
than we do. Yeah, I, I thought about that a lot. And I like, I like the phrase divided we stand. I was thinking of that during 9-11. Yeah, because like so many people are different and they come from different backgrounds, they have different beliefs and opinions. But that doesn't mean that we can't find a common cause. Mm. Um, but humans aren't built that way. Mm -mm. We're just not we were we're very tribal. And even if we can intellectually see that we have a common cause, our deepest emotions are going to want to fight with the other tribe. And so we're always going to be justifying that behavior. My experience overseas, you know, talking to locals in non-permissive, dangerous places informs me that all people have some common values. One of them is that we, everybody hates cancer. Everybody wants <laughs> something better for their kids, you know, and, and everybody's just trying to get through the day. They're trying to survive. Um, would you add? Where did you go? What's that? Oh, I've been to Afghanistan, Where? Iraq, and I went off the camp all the time and interacted cool. with the locals. So I got to see, you know, what normal is for them. And then I would deliver that normalcy back to the U.S., we'll say. And then vice versa. I would take what the U.S. had and was trying to do and try to deliver that in a way that the locals could understand it. And that was sort of my form of, of spying. It doesn't sound very sexy. I found out about bombs and stuff. But the really important work was that communication of trans reality. Sure. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. It was... Uh... It was fascinating. But so would you add any universal values to that? Like they all, we all hate cancer. What can we add in just globally? I mean, obviously we can't agree on climate change. Yeah. We, yeah, universal values. One of the ones that I see is that we, this is going to sound so corny, but it's totally true. We love each other. Like we're social creatures. And the only difference between some people and other people, people who hate more versus people who love more is the radius of who they consider their people. Mm. So what this world needs is we need to expand that radius to include the entire world. We need to think of ourselves as one race of people, human beings, because problems like climate change, Problems like, God forbid, an asteroid starts hurtling to the earth. Like, how are we going to, how are we going to stop that? No, it's not. I, I, <laughs> I, I give us, I give us no chance of working together to solve that problem based on how we've dealt with climate change. So like, those are the, those are the real challenges and all the other challenges disappear as soon as you start to think of us as one people, you don't have wars anymore. You don't have immigration problems anymore. Um, you don't have poverty anymore. And it's just a matter of expanding our sphere of who we consider to be our people, our tribe. And that's just an intellectual switch that people can turn. Mm. And I, I, don't, I don't know why people can't do it. I guess I was just raised to be a total bleeding heart liberal by my parents and to, to, to see all human beings as they were Christian, they were liberal Christians. So they were in the American Baptist church mm -hmm. and they taught that, um, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself and your neighbor equals any other person. Um, be kind to strangers, mm -hmm. um, pray for those who hurt you, you know, just the whole thing, all, all of those sappy liberal messages of Jesus that, that we have conveniently shuffled under the rug. Um, and, we're never, we're never going to get there because we just don't have the will. I don't think as, um, as a people. When we were kids, we were really working on as a society here in the U S you know, the elimination of color from our, our decision set, you know, like it doesn't matter what color you are, you know, and, and that's sort of the libertarian in me. I, I don't care what orientation you are, how you define your gender. I just care that you're, you're a good person. You know, you're trying to pull your own weight. And if you're able to pull your own weight, you're helping somebody else who can't get there, you know, just like in general, contribute to your society. But we seem to have be on, the, and I know the pendulum will swing back, but we seem to be really easy, ready to dismiss people, to not collaborate. I, I hear a lot of people, because I talk to everybody, you know, I talk to folks on the right, the left, in the middle, 
and too many folks want it to be everything red or everything blue, you know, when really we need a balance in all of these things to get somewhere. It's, yeah, the yeah. the real dichotomy is not between red and blue. It's not between right and left mm -hmm. in this country and in this world. The real dichotomy is between the rich and powerful and everyone else. And the rich and powerful make up a tiny percentage of the world's population. Everyone else is 99% of the world's population. And they generally agree on a lot of things. But the rich and powerful are rich and they're powerful. <laughs> so they can prop up entire structures yeah. and entire governments and entire countries yeah. to further their aims, to make it look like it's an even 50-50 balance. Mm -hmm. They can... They can propagandize and convince gullible people that what they want and what's good for them is also good for those people. So I think a lot of people have been duped by that. And that, that unfortunately, that's the situation that we're in. Um, when we talk about you, the 1%. I always encourage people to scope the camera back and look at where the 1% really is. And, you know, it's, it's truly all of us here in the U S as we are talking about, we, earlier. we are the U S among the world's population right. are in the 1%. No question. Yeah. I mean, uh, my example is always, we poop into potable water, you know? Yeah. And, and it's then true. flush it and then don't give that, that it's waste true. another thought unless it backs up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden we call a plumber because that waste needs to go somewhere else. That is yeah. the, epitome of decadence and luxury, you know, throughout the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to respond to what you're saying about like seeing a colorless world because yeah, it's funny when I, when I grew up, my grandmother had that opinion and, and my parents had a different opinion. My, my okay. parents' opinion was that we're not ready for a colorless world because that ignores the context that for example, in this country, black people live in, right. they are, they are dealing with generational poverty. They're dealing with the fact that some, for some of them, only two generations earlier, they were slaves. So those people have a harder time. Oh my God, listen to me. Those people, uh, <laughs> poor people with generational poverty, people yeah. in dire circumstances have to work harder. And when there's prejudice against them in the larger culture, they have to work harder. So I like that we're in what I like to think of as a post there is no color world where we are all now learning that context and that that context is important because we aren't equal. Mm -hmm. Some people have more privilege than other people and we have to accept that and work within that context. But yeah, ideally we're one day we're in a world where human beings are, uh, in the same context and we kind of treat everybody the same and give yeah. everybody the same opportunity. I just don't think we're capable of that based on our history at this point. Is America a good place? Well, I think we're incredibly lucky to be living in this place, given all the places that we could be living now or in the past. So it's good for us. It gives us tremendous privilege. I think it could be doing a lot more good in the world. It could be a lot more of a leader on things that really matter. Um, but I don't think I'm not a patriot. I don't think in terms of patriotism, I think it's a childish, silly thing to think mm -hmm. uh, that like rah, rah, my country. I've never been one of those people. All I care is, is the policy good? Is it helping people? And are we moving forward as uh, a species? And I think we could be doing a lot better. Like, you, you know, that dichotomy, like um, the love it or leave it versus I love it. That's why I want to fix it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And then um, are we are we getting better? I mean, when you look back 40 years, 80 yeah, years, I think in years. some ways, in some ways, we're getting better. Okay. And in other ways, we're getting worse. <laughs> That's probably how it's always going to be. You know? Yeah. And, and everything's a balance here, right? Like we always have to balance, you know, we want businesses to succeed so that people do get wealthy and that they invest back into the community, whether it's through jobs or, you know, yeah. I mean, look at the Getty but, for crying out loud. That museum is incredible. The government couldn't do that. And if they did, it would suck. It would be shitty. You know, the, we, we, we do need the pendulum to swing back though. Uh, mm -hmm. So that the, the disparity is not so insane at this point. Like you got to give the, the rest of the people 
a little bit of a, a leg up. Uh, it's just swung way too far. Yeah, yeah. In in the direction of the wealthy and and away from like I feel like in the last hundred years there are more social services, more of a social safety net, which yeah. people appreciate and like. We need more of that. And I know that's not a very popular political opinion, but uh, it's what we need. Like it's those things are good. I struggle with the isolationist in me um, fighting with the the hawk in me who who tries to eat the dove in me. You know, like I've got this, mm. this triple problem and, and I'll use uh, Syria as an example, you know, because uh, just 24 months ago or so. You know, there was human atrocities going on there. If we do the same thing in China. All over the world, we can find these things. And we're, we, we hate seeing babies getting blown up on TV. We hate it. And we want to act like we care about it, but we don't actually act like we care about it. You know, I, I struggle right. with these things. Like, is it our business to be in the Civil War? You know, we tend to make those things worse. And, you know, lately, what are your thoughts? Like, how do we wrestle with the hawk dove isolationist aspects of our, our own personal lives? Yeah, well, another incredibly unpopular political opinion that I have is that we need to be moving toward one world government. I liked the idea of the League of Nations. I like the idea of the UN. It doesn't work because too many people don't take it seriously. They don't recognize its power. But if the UN was powerful, things like Syria wouldn't happen. You know, there wouldn't be as much agony and torture and uh, destitution in other countries uh, as there is if we, again, because the UN, the idea of the UN is, is thinking of the entire human race as one tribe. And that's where we need to go. I don't like nationalism at all. I think it's really stupid. What's the point? Like literally, what's the point of that? Yeah. All it does is if you want to maintain your privilege, makes a lot of sense. But that's not my goal. My goal is to make sure that no one is so unprivileged that they have to resort to the horrors that we see in the world. When you realize that Raqqa and Rome are separated by a thousand miles and so is Chicago and Denver. It's crazy. It's That's crazy. <laughs> it's crazy to, to know that that's, that's what, you know, poverty and look you just go another couple hundred miles further don't even go all the way to san francisco and you're on you you know you're on the uh, you're in asia minor where the That's, world's a completely different yeah. place yeah how so can we find a world where, and, and and that's also like okay we're looking at wilson league of nations and then again the scale on that guy is like god look at the bad side of wilson and it's just yeah he's practically a a, a clansman yeah you know <laughs> it's it's insane so how do we get to these things? Because just yesterday, we were talking about caring for the ocean. And the ocean is part of a global system because you have, you know, the terra, the water, and then the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And and managing that and getting resources to that, you know, it'd be China has to manage its exploding middle class, has to provision them with things. And that includes air conditioning and cars and fish. And there's just not enough resources to continue. India, same thing on a slightly smaller scale, but still way bigger than us. How do we manage these things globally? How do we look at, you know, emerging nations and say, no, 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 you don't get to have all the stuff that we have. Yeah, that's really, a, that's tough. Obviously, that's really tough. If we had taken Wilson's proposal seriously, we wouldn't have been in this situation. Obviously, we can't go back in time. But so many of these, uh, these depleted resources are a result of the last 100 years. And that was the right time to start thinking about world government. It's too late now because the ocean is dying. Tuna is going to go extinct. And uh, we're going to be in trouble when the ocean dies. We, we don't care about the ocean right now. We don't care that it's acidifying. It doesn't affect us, we don't think. Um, but wait till the polar ice caps melt. And then a lot of people are going to care. <laughs> so... Yeah, yeah. There's, there, you know, I hate to be a doomer about it, but we're doomed. Well, it's it's a certainly a, a possible outcome that that we're not doing much about. There are a lot of businesses and universities working on solving these problems at the micro level, and we need all of that to happen to to hopefully have a couple. If of I, big yeah, ones. if I if I was a scientist and if that was my calling, I'd be working tireless, yeah, uh, tirelessly j just to try to come up with some sort of technological solution to some of this stuff. Yeah, it feels feels very daunting. I can't remember the name of the essay. It's a great essay. The 
uh, I'm not going to remember the title. Maybe you will, or maybe someone watching will send it in. But it was an essay in which an alien race had photographed the earth starting from when it was formed mm -hmm. to the present. And it was such a long movie. They played it in fast speed and they made it last one year. Yeah. So for the first few months, it was just molten lava sloshing around. And for the months after that, it was like terraforming happening. Yeah. Human, human beings showed up half an hour before midnight, December 31st. Right. And then in the next few minutes and seconds, the entire topsoil of the earth was de destroyed. Um, the s more species than ever in the history of the planet went extinct, uh, you know, and the, the population exploded. And when you look at it on that time scale, you realize what a literal ticking time bomb we are. It makes, it makes you really pity those poor scientists. And again, I would be doing that if I had any mind for mathematics and science <laughs> and I had gone into that instead of comedy. Because what else can you do? You've got to try. Yeah. But it's, it's throwing one ounce bags of sand off the Titanic. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot to be said about about looking at it like that. And and as we try to chase these solutions in the ocean and everything else, and we have had a bunch of these people on the show, and it's remarkable. Finless Foods is trying to figure out how to print fish in a warehouse, you know, and and that would yep. alleviate our need to fish. And then quickly the ocean would recover in terms of in that one little aspect of the species that are that are endangered. Yeah, but but also. Yeah, it's just these these problems are damning, you know. And they're they're huge. We're also they're working very, on being able to live indefinitely, and and we're knocking on the door of 130, 150, 300 years. Of, yeah, well, that now that strikes me as counterproductive at this point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if you've read Gulliver's Travels, you know you go to the last segment, the last travel, where he goes to that world where the immortals are with the horses. Um. I don't, it's the one where they have like the dots on their heads and they get to be 500 years old and they, they slowly the, lose okay. their minds. His very last world, yeah. I think. Yeah. And, you know, we, we think about the big and the little, but you forget the rest of the book where it's like, yeah, you know, you don't really want to live forever. You want to have your time, yeah. do your work and then get out, you know? Yeah. He, he really lets go and uh, gives you a piece of his mind by, <laughs> by the end of that book. <laughs> hey, well, one last question. Who cracks you up today right now? Who just makes you laugh and, She's just love it. I like Wanda Sykes. I like Bill Burr. And I like uh, Chris Rock. And those are the current ones. There's a lot of like classic stuff that I like. But those are, those are the people working now who I think are at the top of the game. And they, they make me laugh. They're all stand-ups. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, uh, right. Will Ferrell. I like Will Ferrell's movies. Yeah. Uh, he cracks me up. Have you seen Eurovision? Uh, Melissa McCarthy, I think, is amazing. Yeah. Um, I've not seen Eurovision. What is that? Oh, my God. Oh, it's on Netflix, and it's his latest movie, and it's... it's I'll check it out. I can't yeah. wait to see it. It's so good, especially if you know about the Eurovision, like their their star search thing they do every year. All the European countries submit songs. It is... I can't it, wait to see it's it. It's hilarious. Thanks for the tip. There's too many movies and TV shows now. You can't even keep track of them all. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, like, no, I'll hear about a new TV series that's been out three years and people say, Oh, it's a great show. Yeah. I've literally never heard of it. There's just too many. Hey everybody. Try to get uh, Scott's book. He's got three of these things, how to write funny, but this one's called how to write funniest, the book three of your serious step-by-step -step blueprint for creating incredibly irresistibly successful, hilarious writing. I put a link there in the show notes. I'll put one in the, uh, the podcast notes as well. Thanks for the plug, Pete. Yeah. Listen, the onion is, man, it's such a gem. And I appreciate you kind of going off script with me and talking about you know, where you're at sure. because we need more of these conversations, not less. Cause we can all, we don't have to agree to get along and we can all work on the things that we can not agree on, you know? Absolutely. Uh, and I like when I see that, when I see like the, uh, somebody like Matt Gates partnering with somebody like AOC, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's very encouraging to me because there, are, there is common ground yeah. on some things. And, you know, tolerance is a virtue and it's not easy. It's easy to hate what you don't like and what you don't know, but that doesn't Absolutely. get you anywhere. That just creates intolerance. You can't put intolerance into the machine and expect to get tolerance out. It doesn't work. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that does not work at all. 
Well, listen, I, I've taken an hour of your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Come back and do another one with me. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, Pete.